We are CEOs, executives, educators, and professionals from all sectors of society who support the global expansion of betterment in the world through joy and joyly. I'm your host, Cheryl Lynn, founder of the Chair of Joy Experience. Together, we have developed the World Council of Joy, and our council invites CEOs and innovators from impactful organizations to the Joyly podcast. We showcase how generous, bold, and fully engaged they are in their work and what a culture of joy is to them. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Cheryl Lynn, and you are here again at the Joy Lee Podcast, where we engage the world's top thinkers and doers in compelling conversations on the topic of universal language of joy. So our guests present the keys that are illuminating possibilities to present more joy, how we can access it, how we can sustain it, and why it's important in the conversation of the business of joy. Today's speaker is executive coach and and leadership trainer, Robert White. So welcome, Robert. I can't even tell you how excited I am to have you here today. Well, I'm delighted to be with you, Cheryl. Awesome. So Robert has a huge, intensive, extensive, extraordinary background. And uh, I say all this, and we're going to do a whole show just about Robert's life because it's so important. But what's real fun is Joy Lee and uh, Robert White have partnered together to create um, even more joy in the world. So Robert, um, uh, your 1.3 million people that you've brought through your seminars over the years, um, successfully your your service on the uh, Directors of Plant 2020 with Desmond Tutu, um, child abuse and the neglect, um, that the fact that you've worked for large corporations all over the world is extraordinary. And that's why we're working together. But before we jump into all of that, would you mind just taking a few minutes and introducing yourself in the most uh, succinct possible way as uh, uh, that you can muster up? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm old, so there's a lot of things I can say, uh, <laughs> but trying to narrow things here to being with you and uh, the partnership I feel with you in, in terms of bringing more joy to the planet and particularly to companies. Uh, I, um, I built and led two high impact experiential learning companies, LifeSpring and ARC International. We do have over a million, 300,000 graduates of these uh, uh incredible transformational leadership programs. Uh, so that's been a blessing in my life. I've eight children, that's been a blessing in my life. Uh, I've lived abroad for 21 of my working years. Uh, that's been interesting, exciting and rewarding. Uh, so there's a lot of things. And uh, years ago, I wrote a book that's uh, somewhat uh, uh, evergreen in that it still sells quite well on Amazon and, and through my website called Living an Extraordinary Life. And as you know, now this was years ago and it's part of my story really. And that is the subtitle, which is Unlocking Your Potential for Success, Joy and Fulfillment. And the part of my story that connects us, I believe, is that uh, I found myself, I retired or semi-retired at age 46. I moved to Aspen, Colorado. I built a 15,000 square foot home on 76 acres just outside of Aspen. I, I bought a jet, I remarried, I had these four wonderful kids, uh, uh, two birth children, two adopted special needs kids. My life was rich and full. I was skiing 80 days a year. I traveled with the late John Denver for six months presenting environmental education programs. Uh, I traveled to 42 countries. I mean, my life was fantastic. And I started waking up each morning realizing that I didn't have the term really joy at that moment, but I realized that uh, kind of like God wasn't done with me, that all of that accomplishment, all of those symbols of success had not brought me, at the time I used the word happiness, which I later let go of, it's an ephemeral thing. We could talk about that for an hour or two, I think. Um, but what I realized is what was missing in my life was joy. And so I shifted uh, myself. I took a look, uh, you know, we teach about purpose, vision, and values. I took a look at my purpose and what purpose was I living out of at that moment. And uh, what I realized is, and I, I'm going to say this in kind of a simple way, I had moved along to having a purpose of just being a rich guy in Aspen. 
and with all the symbols of success and all flash and all of that stuff. Uh, what I wasn't paying attention to was me. I wasn't spending time uh, looking at what am I really here on the planet for? Uh, what is it that brings me joy? I mean, I've got all the stuff, all the things. I've got this incredible family. And uh, yet I wasn't, wasn't fully experiencing it. So that's what led to writing the book. That's what led to the subtitle. <laughs> and uh, ultimately, that's what led to meeting you. Oh, my goodness. My goodness. Oh, my goodness. Well, for some reason, I felt a real shift in your uh, heart right there. And um, probably because, uh, you know, we're just getting to know each other. But tell me a little bit more, Robert, if you will, about ultimately this led you to writing the book about joy. So what was missing and what is different now? Well, ultimately, what was missing was me being connected to kind of the essential, authentic part of me. Uh, you know, the joke in my family was that Robert was born in a three-piece suit. Uh, you know, I, I was a serious guy. Uh, I was serious. I, I was looking for a business to, to build when I was eight years old. I, I mean, it, it's just been part of my life. And part of my early purpose was, you know, I grew up in, in kind of a difficult situation in poverty and in abuse. And uh, that experience led me to have a purpose of kind of a negative purpose, which was um, to never be poor again. And it fueled me and uh, I became not poor, in fact, kind of just the opposite. And, uh, but that, what I realized is that that was not deeply satisfying to me that while it, it accomplished a lot, actually, I, what I found out is you can have a negative purpose and accomplish a lot. Uh, and I did, uh, I mean, I, I, I went way beyond bucket list in terms of, of what I accomplished and, and what I had in my life. But uh, what was missing there was a connection to kind of the essential stuff to the you know, I, I now use that expression of living the life you were born to live. I think from a very early age, I was programmed in a different way, not to not to be who I was and not to ex be my unique expression in the world, but rather to simply survive. And survival is absolutely necessary. Food, clothing and shelter are important. Uh, and figuring out a way to do that uh, on a regular basis is an important part of purpose for all lives. Uh, however, they do not include uh, joy and, and fulfillment. So that, that's been the journey for me is discovering more about who I really am underneath the drive, underneath whatever intelligence or ability that I have. And that's also, of course, uh, become incredibly valuable when in the mentoring work that I do now with executives. I can identify with, with many people that are not experiencing joy and in fact, Quite a few of them don't even think about it, but it's kind of there in the background, like like an operating system on a computer, in that it determines everything in terms of their relationships with their team, their relationships with their family, uh, their relationships with the bigger community that all company executives have to pay attention to now. So my struggles along the way and and living a more joyful life uh, have translated to a business opportunity and a contribution. So that's a, and I didn't do that like on purpose. That's just kind of the, being in the flow and that's how it turned out for me. But what I've discovered in working with people is, and, and in surveying people, many people, when I ask the question, how many of you are in a group setting? How many of you are estranged from a family member right now? The answer is 70% in audiences from 200 to 2000. When I ask how many of you have been betrayed and carry some anger or some hurt or some sadness about that, that number is 100%. 100% of people, executives that I work with, uh, uh, number one, are estranged from somebody in their family, and number two, are uh, uh, have been betrayed and are kind of buried it, have, uh, are operating in some kind of hurt uh, about that. So it's my journey, but what I've learned is it's not uncommon. I love that. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. And I, I appreciate the fact that you can bring the wisdom to our partnership and to our executives as we go forward together, because it, 
It is exactly what you say. First of all, we talked about the chair of joy practice, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. But you've said over the years, many, many years, that a practice, daily practice of some kind is important. So um, I want to just say that I get that you're doing that, that you have an intentional joy. Every day you know that it's work to focus on joy and to get your vibration higher. And number two, you've nailed active joy. Like you really know how to bring it up in you and then present it in a joyous way to others so that everyone can um, feel evolved and elevated. So I appreciate and congratulate you for that. So let's talk about the chair of joy. We're not gonna go through experience because I've done that you know, hundreds of times already on the podcast. So you've been through it and I'd like for you A, to talk about practices in general, what that means for people, and then what you've learned in the chair of joy experience yourself and how you think that could affect corporations? Well, I, uh, for a number of years, I, uh, you know, people will say, well, Robert, you know, you're basically running a cult. And, you know, when you're running large groups and reaching over a million people, that's a, a kind of a easy thing for somebody who doesn't know much about it and have, has not participated. Look at it from the outside. We've got these large crowds of people that are so excited and focused and having fun together and lots of hugs and lots of exclamations of praise with each other. And so, you know, the cult uh, accusations always kind of been there in the background. And, uh, you know, cult comes from culture and absolutely we are a cult. I, I've been creating a cult all my life without knowing it because I believe in a positive culture. Uh, the expression that culture eats strategy for breakfast has been attributed to many people, uh, certainly to Peter Drucker, the, the great management theorist. And it does. I mean, culture is everything in an organization, in a family, and, and, and ultimately in a nation. And so I've been looking at how to create a culture that works, one that has positive life affirming values, and that uh, I, I would quarrel only with one small word, um, Cheryl, and that's work. It's not work. It, it is a habit, certainly a habit to develop that you spend, uh, you know, I've, I've learned that with the executives that I work with, yes, they have to rediscover their personal purpose, vision, and values, their strategic intent for their organization. There's all, the, all of those things that I work with them on. Uh, however, how do you how do you have this transformational experience stay alive in your life? And the answer to that is to have some kind of a daily practice. It can be prayer, it can be meditation, it can be a walk in the woods, or it can be the chair of joy. And when I first heard about your work, I thought, oh, that's an interesting gimmick. That, well, that was my first reaction. Uh, that's, I thought, that's clever because that's a thing that people can identify with. Everybody has, a ch has have chairs in their lives. And I thought, well, it's all about this fancy chair that, that, that Cheryl has. And, uh, but when I went through the experience myself, what I realized is, that the chair is just a, a prop. It is a tool to bring you into an experience of being with yourself in a quiet way. And that you do some things that I've been teaching forever in our trainings, uh, beginning with take a deep breath, you know, to, to quiet yourself, uh, put your feet flat on the floor. That's been taught by meditation experts forever. And uh, you don't clutter it up with any Indian words or, arcane practices. It's just very simple and yet actually profound. And uh, I think I'm attracted to things that uh, that take complexity and reduce it to the simple. And I do that in my work. I do that in, in various areas of my life. And when I went through that experience with you, what I realized is you've taken something that's incredibly complex, has incredible depth to it, and made it very simple, very easy to use. So the idea that three times a day you take a moment for yourself, I mean, how radical is that? <laughs> I think it's wonderful. I think the, the, it's, 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 it remains clever. You know, you can look at it as a gimmick if you like, I don't care, uh, but it works. And uh, so I'm, I'm uh, delighted to find it or find the idea. Um, it aligns with what I've been teaching for many years and what I've been working with in my executive mentoring practice. <clears throat> Thank you for that. And it was an absolute pleasure to take you through the practice, you and hundreds of other people. We've been to 35 cities and people 
really just want to be seen and heard. And when they sit in this chair or when I ask them, where is your chair of joy in your house? They often say, I don't have one. And then they say, oh my God, I have a favorite red chair in the corner. Or I sit in my deck on my deck chair all the time and listen to the birds. And so it's just a matter of uh, taking what they already know. Like you said, this isn't rocket science. This is this is a program that I've been working on for a couple of years um, to really fine tune and really my whole life. But the idea is um, when they see the chair of joy and they're seen and heard, they can they can they can cord- sort of have permission to go home and do it for themselves. So yeah. I, I want you I would love for you to talk a little bit more, um, Robert, about um the fact that you teach through experiential learning, like experiential learning is the really the expansion of life, which is basically my my tagline. Like that's my Joy Lee podcast, life expansion through experience. So talk to me a little bit about that. And I know the chair of joy is just one of the many things that we're going to do, but how is that important for corporations? I know you've worked with Chase and all different kinds of uh, large uh, companies. How has that been impactful? Uh, well, you know, the background of experiential learning goes back to World War II. And when all of the men, mostly men, 99%, went off to war. And, uh, but we won that war three ways. One was, the sa- first of all, the sacrifice of uh, hundreds of thousands of men and women who gave their life for freedom in Europe and Asia. Uh, the second way we won was good leadership. If you analyze the leadership flow in World War II. You could study that for years and there are incredible positive lessons in it, uh, both in terms of good leadership and not so good leadership. And uh, the third thing uh, and and, a vital thing that won those two wars, I mean, we fought two wars at once, was production. We outproduced the world. We made more ships, more guns, more ammunition, more airplanes, more everything. Well, who made them? I mean, the men went off to war. Who made the ships and, and the guns and the, and the tanks and all of that stuff? It was women. Women, for the first time, were brought into the workforce. And jobs that previously required years and years of apprenticeship, they learned in 90 days. And after the war, the Defense Department noticed that and realized what an incredible uh, event had just taken place in many ways. And so they studied, they set up something called the National Tr- Training Labs. Uh, and that became, uh, ultimately became the uh, human potential movement because what they learned is you we learn best by experience. There's a book that I don't particularly recommend, but it has a great title. You don't learn to ride a bicycle from a book. You don't learn, and I would add to that, or from a video or from a talk, or from uh, some motivation. You learn to ride a bicycle by getting on the bike, by getting through your fears, by taking some chances, maybe by getting a coach, maybe somebody helped you the first time that you you rode a bike. Uh, You learn by getting hurt. You learn by the exhilaration of actually doing it. And if you haven't ridden a bicycle for 10 years, you can get on a bike, you might be a little bit shaky at first, but you can get on a bike and ride it 10 years later. That memory, that body cell level memory is part of you. So that's a simple way to talk about experiential learning, that we put people into learning games, simulations, and uh, uh, have some fun together, but with a deeper meaning and purpose. So our work with executives at Chase, we had had, uh, 14,000 graduates at Chase. We helped turn that company around and get it merged uh, with JP Morgan. We have 18,000 graduates at Duke Energy, the old Duke Power, when they were making their transition from a a, a controlled uh, utility into an aggressive and incredibly successful energy, energy company. So those are the kinds of things that we've done by getting people into these learning games, simulations, and conversations, guided conversations, that where they get to reveal what's real for them, what's real in terms of what's blocking them, what's real in terms of their potential, and what they could do both individually and as a team. So that's a little bit about it. That's not the experience, (laughs) but that's describing a little bit about the experience. 
Oh, and so important to learn. Like I've never heard it said like that before. So I appreciate it that, you know, the chair of joy is a simple process, but so is in anything that you take on and put your, your own self into learning to play the guitar or to garden or whatever it is. Like, like you said, videos are great and you can learn some things, but until you actually do it and put your whole body and system through it, it, it doesn't really get ingrained. So my next question is around, I've been carrying this book around with me for many, many years. And uh, I would love for you to tell a little story about this and maybe a joyful moment that you had with this amazing man, Desmond Tutu. Wow. Uh, you know, there are some, some experiences and some people in my life that are really difficult to talk about in terms of uh, impact. I, I was um, so honored to be invited to join the board of, of the Desmond Tutu Peace Foundation. And, uh, and certainly my fellow board members are the most amazing people. I feel frankly inadequate sometimes just being in the room with them. Uh, just absolutely incredible people, people of accomplishment, people of, with a service heart that, that I, I'm just blown away by. Being in the presence of Archbishop Tutu uh, and, and his wife, well, it's to be in the presence of joy and, uh, you know, that expression, a man of God, I'm not sure fully what that means, except it means Desmond Tutu, because if, if you're with him, the energy in the room changes. I don't know a better way to say that. And it changes to one of inclusivity of, of joy, of peace of fun. This guy has so much fun. He tells jokes. He's, and yet he's incredibly intentional. He's up to something. He's been through a life experience that I think is difficult for, for us to imagine through the transition in South Africa and now the pain and breakdown in South Africa. And I have not spoken with him about that recently, but I kind of don't have to. I know how he I know how he is, what his being is, and I'm sure I'm a hundred percent certain he's approaching it as yes, there are problems. And what's the potential here for our people, for, for me, for my family and for this nation, uh, just an absolutely amazing man to be, uh, in the presence of, or, uh, to represent, because I, I do ask myself. And when I'm when I supporting the foundation, um, I do ask myself, how would the Archbishop handle this? I think I'm kind of rambling, but no, that's awesome. I I do the same thing. When I ever I get stuck, I just open this book and uh, read a couple of chapters. And I think that I think that the intentional joy that we have been talking about is is who they are and what they've learned throughout their lifetime and. Yes, there's sadness and anger and hurt and chaos and crazy and stress and even happiness is over there. We get to dip into all of that because it's the human condition, right? We get to play with those emotions. We wouldn't be humans. But joy, I believe, is much uh, something that is in the need category that you talked about before, which is shelter, food, water, air, and joy. People that are dying, you know, we have so many seniors in our world right now that aren't being seen and heard. Like, what if they were seen and heard in the chair of joy? What if we brought attention to them and let them understand that, you know, your memories and your heart and who you are is important and joyful to the world. Let's, let's learn more about you. So anyway, our mission uh, here, uh, thank you for sharing that about Desmond Tutu. I, we we're going to talk lots more about that. I know there's tons of stories in there. Um, but our mission is to make sure that everyone in the world, everyone, every company, every family knows the practice of the chair of joy, because the conversation of joy, the language of joy, what we're producing uh, here with Robert White and all of his amazing wisdom. I can't even tell you how grateful I am, Robert, to to tap into the so many years of, so, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying that's that in a negative way, but I, I, I think that that we are in a timely place, right? For you to, and your work to be everywhere. Wouldn't you agree? And I just, I just want to tell you how honored I am to be part. Well, uh, a strength that I think I have that when carried too far becomes a weakness is humility maybe. And part of that comes from, uh, you know, I, I, I've been in enough 
therapeutic settings to understand that growing up in the environment that I grew up in, it, there's no way that I could could easily accept praise. Uh, but I do appreciate it, and I'm I'm getting better at it, um, marginally better. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, look, I I had three really great mentors in my life. And uh, when they unfortunately are, all of them are no longer with us. When the last one, Dr. John Jones died, I went out to San Diego for a memorial service. And I was sitting on the airplane on the way back and, you know, taking that deep breath after, a, I mean, it was a joyful celebration. This guy contributed not just to my life, but to thousands, and maybe millions of people's lives. Um, but I was a little sad and I'm realizing that I was missing him already. And then the, this like really uncomfortable thought occurred to me sitting on this airplane is that I've had these three great teachers. Now I'm the teacher and it was uncomfortable. Uh, but it, uh, what I realized is that I have learned some things. And, you know, you mentioned, uh, I mentioned the relationship with John Denver. You know, John and I shared many things and traveled together and our families vacation together and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and, you know, we had been long before I met him, we were using his music in our trainings. So, you know, there are a lot of different levels to the relationship. But one of the things that we loved to do when he would get off the road and I'd get off the road is the down valley from Aspen is a little town called Glenwood Springs. And they have, it is hot springs. I mean, it is a huge hot springs pool or several of them. And it has vapor caves. I don't know if you've ever heard of those, but that's where in these kind of volcanic uh, areas, you know, the hot steam comes up through the rock. And they have turned this cave into a tourist thing that you could do or a, in effect a spa. And uh, so if you go there, you know, you cook in the steam for a while and then you go take a shower and and get a massage and then you go back and cook for a while and then you have a macrobiotic lunch. So we did those a day together like that several times. And in, in one of them, uh, John got kind of quiet and I, I, I just kind of challenged him about that. He said, well, I'm thinking about you. <laughs> I said, I guess that's good. Maybe I hope. And he said, uh, I said, well, what are you thinking? He said, I'm thinking that you think you're a pretty big deal, but your real contribution is ahead of you. That was a very memorable moment for me. Uh, I, I realized I needed to hear it. I needed to hear that I'm not coasting out of life, that there's more for me and, and that I need to step into it. And I need to, you know, my book, Living an Extraordinary Life, is not about me. And, and people actually challenge me about that. They'll, they'll read the book and then they'll say, oh, I love the book. I love it. I love it. But I was disappointed. And of course, I say, what are you disappointed about? And they say, because it's not about you and your extraordinary life. And I go, no, it's about our graduates, about their interaction with our experience. And uh, But there is one chapter that's really about me. And it doesn't say that in the book, but, you know, we'll reveal the secret here. And the book is that uh, uh, the most commonly held belief that operates in the world is I am not enough. You are not enough. That's what I grew up with. That's what I've been reacting against. You know, uh, I have been uh, up until that moment with John. I realized I've been protesting against you are not enough for all of these years. And it's kind of an, I'll show you motivation. And so I don't dishonor the motivation. It worked. Uh, you know, that I'll show you, I'll show you that a severe introvert can get up in front of 8,000 people. Uh, you know, I'll show you that uh, I, I can have this financial success. I'll show you that I, I can meet three presidents. So it, it works at one level. What it doesn't do is produce joy and satisfaction. And uh, that I had to get that handled, that you are not enough piece and realize that I am enough. I'm not perfect. I'm still, I still struggle with my weight. I've been incredibly good at getting married. I'm incredibly bad at staying married. You know, I mean, I, I, I'm not very disciplined, right? All of that stuff, but I'm enough. Uh, and that's been part of my journey. 
That gives me uh, chills through my body because I feel like there's a piece of that in everyone, right? And I think what John said, you know, that what what is in life for you lies ahead. And maybe in our work, we can produce some of that um, even more for the world. So that is, that is one of my wishes. Um, yeah, let's help people feel like they're enough. That's what a great mission that is. You know, and an interim purpose for me as I was building those two companies has been, uh, so I'll say the fancy version and then I'll say the casual version. So the fancy version is to enroll the maximum number of people in a transformational experience, right? So we reached a million, 300,000 people. All right, we fulfilled that purpose, at least to some degree. But the casual way of saying it is putting asses in seats. And that's the, and when we were talking internally, that's the expression we use. <laughs> yeah, that's what we track. We did not track it, pr track profit. We did not track revenue. We, we track asses in seats. And I think it's just interesting. It just occurred to me a moment ago that, you know, the circle is now complete. I've come around to creating this incredible relationship with a woman whose entire uh, structure is around putting asses in seats, uh, but it's the, it's the chair of joy. Isn't that interesting? Here we go. Let's uh, let's reach double or quadruple that that amount of people um, with the chair of joy. And uh, I can't think of a better partner in this process. I mean, there are many coming through the World Council of Joy. Many people like. Wouldn't it be great to have Desmond Tutu sit in the chair of the joy at some chair of joy at some point? Um, but people from all over the world are are hearing the message. They're understanding that um, transformation is timely. It's happening. It is happening. And this, of course, is another method and another tool. But um, I think the work that we're going to do in corporations is important. And um, maybe you could just tell us one quick story of a successful uh, a successful executive. Like, what were they when they came into your experience, and who were they when they came out? Have you ever dropped your phone on the floor, on your face, or in some other embarrassing place? Don't you wish there was something you could attach to your phone case that would help you hold your phone so you don't have to, or at least as much? Introducing Steady Straps, a comfortable, adjustable, strong, elastic strap with 100% Velcro brand closures that helps you hold your phone more securely without dropping it and use it easier and faster, especially one-handed. It's the only smartphone grip accessory without adhesives, and it's 100% wireless charging ready without having to remove or adjust it first. Check us out at SteadyStraps.com and order some today. Wow, uh, that's uh, challenging, first of all, because I'm so wired to keep things confidential. Right, but right, I, generally. Uh, but a, a general statement, uh, you know, we had a, a major relationship with Chase Bank. And the way it started was that they had done I mean, they knew they needed to change long before they ever met us. And uh, they had they had bought these change management systems. They had spent millions and millions of dollars on it. When I first went to Chase, to the, to the bank, I was still living in Tokyo. I moved to New York. Uh, fortunately, they paid for it. Um, and, uh, and we had uh, lunch in the executive dining room. You should see about the executive dining room for Chase. <laughs> it's it's pretty cool. <laughs> and uh, after lunch became a little tour where they could talk about what they'd been trying to do in the past. And they took me to this huge room filled with these uh, floor to almost ceiling racks, metal racks. And it was all the material, the paper material of, from their latest change management failure because that particular one had all kinds of forms that you fill out to create change. And it had been a total bust. And they were open about that. I, I, I was actually impressed by the honest level of honesty. It's pretty hard to admit that you spent millions and millions of dollars on something that just totally failed. In fact, got people angry and, and had people, key people left as a result of it, things like that. Uh, and our first training with Chase was uh, 32 people. And this is going to sound really simple, uh, Cheryl, but I think you, you can get it. And I think listeners can get it. It was the first time in the history of Chase Manhattan Bank and their entire 100 plus year history. It was the first time the top 30 people were in the same room at the same time. 
because the way that Chase operated was these individual fiefdoms. And if you were in charge of Chase in Brazil, it was like you were the prince. Uh, you know, there was a king off somewhere, but you were operating your own little kingdom. Hmm. And you can imagine what that led to in terms of that, that the physical distance, but also the emotional distance that these people felt with each other. And we put them in our little games and simulations and forced, somewhat forced, conversations. And, uh, you know, American Bankers Magazine's story on that, which Chase sourced, we didn't source it, uh, said that uh, that conversation turned around that massive bank. Now, they had to do the work. They had to have the willingness to, the, to, to risk. Uh, they had the willingness to get rid of a few people who were literally standing in the way of the change that needed to take place. And, and they had the courage and the clarity coming out of that meeting uh, to, do the, to do the work of it. You know, we, we, we can do the transformational setup. We can change some hearts and minds. We can get people looking at things in a different way. But ultimately, somebody has to do the work. And then, uh, you know, what's helpful in the case of organizations is when you can take that experience and duplicate it, cascade it down through the various levels of a company so that people start having the same language about personal accountability, about uh, focus, about alignment, about commitment. But the way it starts is, a, is an honest conversation about uh, this was our past. There's some things that we need to celebrate about it, some things we need to let go of here's current reality you know strengths weaknesses whatever this is the truth about where we are right now and if you've dealt with those two things the past and current reality it creates a space for choosing a future and really choosing it not just to be an extrapolation of the past so whether it's an individual uh, a small medium-sized company an entrepreneurial effort or a major corporation the pattern is the same bring people together, get them telling the truth about what's really important for them in their personal lives and in their company. What is their purpose? What is their vision? What is What are their values and are they living them? And then what's your strategic intent? What are some goals that are gonna shake you up and get you out of these past patterns? So that, that's, that's kind of how I look at what we do. Uh, every individual story is uh, you know, I mean, I've, I've been one-on-ones mm -hmm. -on where I end up in tears. Yeah. Uh, crying. Yeah, the same, same, same for sure. So we are running out of time, but I, I want to just save a little bit of time for one more uh, co one more comment. So we are definitely in the experience economy. Um, Joy Lee and the Chair of Joy are uh, experiences and, and, and of course, um, all of the, the simulations that Robert White teaches are resulting in better communication, increased productivity, employee engagement, and more profitable business. So Wherever you are and whatever you're doing, we invite you to take a chair, maybe give us a call and uh, to learn more. We are really open to that and having a further conversation with, with you. So Robert, um, just to wrap things up, if you don't mind, just um, leaving one comment for our listeners about um, what you think uh, you have learned so far in our partnership and uh, what they might um, do to move forward in their joy today. I've become more aware that uh, the the idea of, uh, particularly for executives and top managers, the idea that joy should be part of their goal set is, uh, I think, foreign, a foreign idea. And I think they, they know it intuitively. They know it when they give it some thought or they spend some time with it. But, uh, you know, the, most executives are busy with, with revenue and profit and, and new product and pe people issues. And, but I think it's, it, people are kind of sensing and feeling that since we spend one third of our lives at work, that joy better be a part of it. And that learning that it's a, a skill set, it's an attitude, it's a habit, and ultimately it's the behavior of sitting in that some chair three, day, three times a day. I think the awareness of that is growing. And I think the number of people that are willing to take responsibility for creating that in their own lives and in their organizations, 
I think that space is growing. I think people are more and more aware of that, uh, that, you know, that old Broadway song about what's it all about. I think that question is occurring to more people. I'm delighted to be part of it. Uh, I think, I think people need to plug themselves in first personally to, uh, uh, 20 or 30 minutes with you. And, uh, uh, and then from that experience, take a look at how could that improve, not just my life, but the lives of all these people that I'm privileged to lead. Uh, and, uh, uh, so it's exciting. It's a, it's a possibility that you can live into instead of just dealing with the same old problems day after day after day. So uh, let me ask you. Let me quickly ask you a Desmond Tutu uh, inspired answer because let's see if we can channel his energy. If we got everyone on the planet to increase their levels of vibration of joy by sitting in in a chair of joy three times a day, what's possible for the world when it comes to world peace and enlightenment? Uh, look, uh, love is the answer. Love is the question. Uh, love, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, the line from the uh, Course in Miracles, teach only love for that is what we are. And, uh, that's, I think uh, if, uh, if the Archbishop was with us, he'd, he'd be modeling that and he might be saying it, he might Beautiful. be, he might be praying for it. Thank you, Robert. Oh my gosh, from my heart to yours, uh, all the way to Denver, Colorado, which that's where our headquarters are. So um, this is where our uh, connection began through a mutual friend who is in Denver. And um, just, I know we're gonna be doing a lot of uh, amazing things together, events, and we invite all of, all of our listeners to attend and enjoy. So um, again, thank you everybody for listening in and uh, we'll be back again soon with another Joyly podcast. This show has been produced by Market Domination, LLC. To discover how you can have your own show completely done for you and turn it into a real published book and become the authority in your marketplace, go to www.marketdominationllc.com slash podcast offer.